Welcome to The Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast available at thehollywoodoutsider.com, as well as on your favorite podcast app, so please subscribe. And in this particular episode, we are talking exclusively about the nominations for the 93rd Annual Academy Awards. The Oscars 2021 nominations have arrived. Let's get down with the show. I'll be your host, Aaron Peterson. Joining me today is my fellow co-host, Amanda Sink. Hello, hello. Hey, hey, hey. And welcome to the (laughs) Oscar talk. Oscar nominations are out to 2021 Oscar nominations, and it is an odd little year. little weird year. It's very weird. Because we are doing this very late, because technically we would normally have the Oscars done. We would be done with them. We would be looking at next year's (laughs) nominees already, but not this year. Now they get an extra two months. Which doesn't that mean that next year's will lose two months? Technically, they'll get ten months. I, I don't Somebody know somewhere is going to complain about something. That's all I know. Yeah, I'm going to complain because I don't know why Shock <laughs> King didn't get nominated. But besides that, I don't. I don't know what happened here. I don't know why they think that was the right solution. I mean, I get COVID always the answer to whatever question you're having, but you lose two months for next year's awards. And I just don't, yeah, whatever. Hey, I think the intention was originally them trying to be very proactive, especially in a climate where you don't really know anything Mm -hmm. and you can't really be, you can't predict anything. And so they were doing their best to be predictable and say, okay, we are going to, things are going to be shaping up a little bit better. More movies are going to be out by then. They're going to be able to release more and do more and films are going to be, woo, by this time. Well, not necessarily because they extended the cutoff essentially, right? Yeah, they sure did. So that's the whole thing is I think they were really trying to give a little bit of leeway for the filmmakers and productions that were immediately halted without any warning and maybe with the changes as COVID eased a little bit in certain areas that, Mm -hmm. hey, they can finish their production and maybe make it. Hey, whatever works for them. (laughs) It's their awards. It's their their patting each other on the back. They can do whatever they want. I just think it's odd that next year there's going to be like two months shy, but whatever. If you didn't know, the Academy Awards recognize and uphold excellence in the motion picture arts and sciences, inspire imagination, and connect the world to the medium of motion pictures. But they don't like fantasy films much or horror films much and other stuff, but, you know, they connect people. Just as long as you like what they like. (laughs) (laughs) The winners for the 93rd annual Oscars will be announced during the live event on April 25th, 2021 at 7 p.m. Central Time. That's 8 p.m. Eastern Time. That's, you know what, find an app. I I can't go through all the time zones with you, but that's what time it's coming out. (laughs) We're a high quality, we're a high quality operation over here. <laughs> See, I was gonna say, screw the people with different time zones. You didn't even go with Pacific, which is the one that like they air in <sighs> five so. five p.m. Pacific time. Okay, <laughs> five p.m. But now you forgot about the mountain time. I don't. Who lives in the mountains? Mountain people? people. Mountain people. people aren't watching the Oscars. They have mountains. Why? You don't know Why? what they're doing. Maybe they're watching the Oscars with the backdrop of the mountains. They're too busy watching movies made <gasps> about people that live in the mountains that are horribly wrong. Like, no, you'd be dead. You'd be dead. You'd just be dead. <laughs> so I started thinking when I was saying that, I was like, oh, kind of like how Robin Wright is in land when she's sitting in her bathtub outside, just overlooking the beautiful mountains and scenery. Mm-hmm. And then I realized, oh, she's not nominated. Oh, are we going to throw the snub word out? <laughs> I mean, isn't that the key word? Isn't that how we boost our SEO right now? I, I think it, it matters. Yeah, Snub. I do. Snub <laughs> is the thing to say. That's what people love to say. Well, here, I'll say this. Um, land is the better version of Nomad Land. What? I mean, you're probably not wrong there. It was a great film. Although Frances McDormand is one of America's greatest actors. True story. She really, really is. She is. So much talent. She is a phenomena. But you know what? We're going to go through everybody that was nominated. And, you know, even even the categories that you might go like, nobody even watches those. Yeah, yeah, somebody does. The people nominated for sure are going to watch those. So we're going to name everyone. We're going to go through and we'll offer some commentary if we have any about uh, any of the nominees. Because I, I have a question about, is Borat really a screenplay? But we're going to get there. <laughs> that I got to be honest, that was one of my biggest surprises. I was like, uh, uh, Borat a couple of times? All right. <laughs> 
Okay, so we're going to take turns. And Amanda, why don't you start us off with the writing original screenplay nominees? Our nominees are Judas and the Black Messiah, screenplay by Will Burson and Shaka King, story by Will Burson and Shaka King, and Kenny Lucas and Keith Lucas. Minari, written by Lee Isaac Chung. Promising Young Woman, written by Emerald Fennell. Sound of Metal, screenplay by Darius Martyr and Abraham Martyr, story by Darius Martyr and Derek Chanfrantz. Ooh, I'm <laughs> glad you got that one. I don't think I said it right, but I tried. The Trial of the Chicago Seven, written by Aaron Sorkin. Can you mess his name up and be like, Aaron? <laughs> Aaron. Hey, hey, Ron. <laughs> hey, hey, Ron. Hey, Ron Sorkin. <laughs> hey, everybody that ever says that, never heard it before. It's all new. <laughs> hey, hey, Ron, never heard it. Uh, so who, anybody you pulling from? And when I said Shaka King didn't get nominated, I meant for Best Director. He did get nominated. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course. Of course. So what do you uh, feel out of the original screenplay? Where are you at? What are you leaning on? Ooh, I'm a little bit tied between, and, and I'll I'll say that I haven't seen uh, Minari yet. So just give me a little bit of leeway here. But Judas and the Black Messiah was great and Promising Young Woman Really, that screenplay sent me through a few different fields of emotion and mm -hmm. contemplation, and it really, really sat with me in a different way than I was expecting. But Judas and the Black Messiah was one that was incredibly powerful in a different way. It wasn't anything that was unexpected, where Promising Young Woman was, but it still had so much levity and power to it and... Just the emotion and historics of it all, it's hard not to root for it. Trial of Chicago 7 was another great movie, though. So this is just a really great category of films. Yeah. You know what's funny is of all five nominees, I, I finally did see Minari. Beautiful film. Beautiful film. I've heard so many good things about uh, it. I can't wait to watch it. I will. I want to say this. What I find fascinating is how every one of these nominees deserves to win. Like I can't sound of metal is a, is a beautiful film too. And, you know, we don't really talk much about that, but it's a beautiful film about losing your hearing and, and learning and struggling and honestly just struggling with losing a sense. Uh, honestly, some, I can relate. Oh I'm 27 God. and I have hearing, hearing it's loss. So painful, but all, all of these are, are beautiful screenplays, but I would probably lean more toward promising young woman because Black Messiah and Trial of Chicago 7, part of me is like, well, a lot of that is written for you because it's based on history to a degree. I know that's not fair. That's true. But that's I'm going true. with it. I, well, I get, I get where you're coming from, though. And Promising a Young Woman is still the movie where I was left thinking about it long after it was over because, because of the twists in the screenplay, especially near the end and the choices that were made, that, to me, I thought was a very daring choice for the kind of movie it was. So... I'm I'm leaning that way, personally. I still haven't decided how I feel about that ending. Exactly. <laughs> I saw this movie months ago, and I I have not determined, do I love this, or am I infuriated slash annoyed by it, because it didn't <laughs> end how I expected it to. But then it's like that internal contemplation of, okay, but is it your fault that you have expectations or theirs? Seems like a you problem, Amanda. Wow. Well, that's that's who I want to win and also who I predict to win. Is yours the same? You predict Judas and the Black Messiah? I predict Judas to win. Okay. Yeah. I was referencing Promising Young Woman, by the way. Okay. My struggle in accepting. Well, here are the writing nominees for Adapted Screenplay. Borat, subsequent movie film, delivery of prodigious bribe <laughs> to American regime for make benefit once glorious nation of Kazakhstan. I really My can't... Life. I really can't wait for them to rattle that off come Oscar night. <laughs> Screenplay by Sasha, <laughs> Sasha Baron Cohen and Anthony Hines and Dan Swimer and Peter Bainham and Erica Vinoja and Dan Mazur and Jenna Friedman and Lee Kern. Story by Sasha Baron Cohen and Anthony Hines and Dan Swimer and Nina Padrad. Here is what I'm going to say about Borat. Screenplay? Really? I'll come back to it. Hang on. <laughs> The Father, screenplay by Christopher Hampton and Florian Zeller. Nomadland, written for the screen by Chloe Zhao. One Night in Miami, screenplay by Kemp Powers. The White Tiger, written for the screen by Raman Barani. Now, I'll come back to Borat. All of these, very good. Uh, I'm going to predict Nomadland. I'm going to claim Nomadland. Yeah. Uh, because I, I do think that 
Well, actually, you Wait, know what? should we be giving our predictions if we have an Oscar contest this for is a, predictions? It's a guess. It's a guess. We don't know. I yeah. know, but they might take yours to heart because you do pretty good on winning. Uh, you know what? I'm changing mine. I, I, I want the father <laughs> to win. I predict Nomadland will win. How's that? Now, I want to come back to Borat, damn it, because <laughs> that isn't a screenplay. It's almost exclusively ad-libbed. If I don't even get why that's a nomination. There are so many more deserving films that should have been nominated, and I don't get why that gets a nomination. Because it has politics? I mean, yeah, well, that's <laughs> probably part of it. It did, it did create a quite a stir up in politics, and as we all know, Hollywood really likes the stirrups of politics. So, I mean, I, I'm sure that's not all it, but I I, it, I was very surprised that the Oscars, out of all of the obscure films to choose that are outside of the very artsy world, very clicky world of the Academy Awards, that Borat subsequent movie <laughs> film word, 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 managed to get a couple Oscar nominations. And 47 people are nominated. I think that tells you that that's not really a... I mean, this looks like the Justice League screenplay for Crying Out Loud. There's too, oh, many, people, there's too many people involved behind the scenes. It just... It shouldn't win. But No Man Land, I think, will win. I I am pulling for the father because now, now that I've seen it, God, what a horribly difficult screenplay. That had to be to write, and it works, but it's very hard to. It's almost like Inception with your grandfather. It's it's a it's a very difficult film to watch and understand, but it does make sense. That's a hard screenplay. What about you? I definitely think that Nomad Land's gonna gonna nail that one, but I'm I would be more pulling for The Father or One Night in Miami. Oh, One Night in Miami is such a good film. Such a, there's a lot of great films here, and and when we get we're going to visual effects now. And I am so excited a certain movie got nominated. So please tell us. The first one of our nominations, I'm going to presume, Love and Monsters yeah, is our first baby. nominee. One of my favorite of last year. Loved it. Matt Sloan, Genevieve Camilleri, Matt Everett, and Brian Cox. The Midnight Sky, Matthew Kasmer, Christopher Lawrence, Max Solomon, and David Watkins. Mulan, Sean Faden, Anders Langlands, Seth Maury, and Steve Ingram. The one and only Ivan, Nick Davis, Greg Fisher, Ben Jones, and Santiago Colomo Martinez. And then Tenet, Andrew Jackson, David Lee, Andrew Lockley, and Scott Fisher. You can call him Miss Jackson if you're nasty. Is that Brian Cox? <laughs> <laughs> is that Brian Cox the actor? <laughs> I'm like, what? The, why is he here? I don't I know. Don't know. <laughs> He's got a side gig, apparently. No, I'm sure it's a different Brian Cox. So who, who, do you, who are you pulling for? Do you want to drop predictions? Is that what you're trying to tell me? I feel like we probably should. I feel like we should go with who we want to win because it's so easy to talk about who we think is going to win because it's <laughs> it's yeah. kind of okay. predictable for the Academy. All right. But who we root for, I think, is what people are going to care more about what our personal ones are. Or they might hate them. They might love to hear us, you know, have a different opinion than them. All right. Well, congratulations. Amanda just evicted any edge you had by using our picks. So <laughs> we're going to just give what we, who we want to win. So go ahead, Amanda. Continue. I really want Love and Monsters to win for visual effects. Me too. Me too. Such a fun movie. And it took me so long to see, even though I know that you and Johnny, our other co-host on The Hollywood Outsider, talked so much about how great that movie was and how fun it was. And I think the timing of it, I really wish I would have seen it right when it came out because we were in such a... It was like a dry spell of fun movies like that, mm -hmm. but it was it was wonderful, and I was it was completely different than what I was expecting. The visuals though were a lot of fun, so I am going to second that. Love and Monsters, and yeah, Tenet would be close. It had some wonderful visual effects, but man, I'm just I just love Love and Monsters. I, I got taken away by the designs, the monsters th themselves, just the world and. You know, I love when a, a film like that, that went video on demand, and you could tell probably wouldn't have been a mega hit regardless. It gets a little love, and I appreciate that. Now let's go to sound, because they still don't have stunt Oscars, because that's still a thing, where we don't have that, even though they risk their lives Stupid. to entertain your ass. <sighs> Tenant. Look at that. All the people that got injured trying to make, they're trying to 
you know, got bruised and bloodied and everything else making that movie and Mulan. Ugh, they get no recognition. Nice Academy. Even TV does this. Sorry, that was a tangent. Sound. <laughs> sound. Nominees for sound. Greyhound, Warren Shaw, Michael Minkler, Bo Borders, and David Wyman. Mank, or Stank, as I like to call it. <laughs> Ren Kleiss. Shade. Jeremy Malad, David Parker, Nathan Nance, and Drew Coonan. News of the World, Oliver Tarney, Mike Prestwood-Smith, William Miller, and John Pritchett. Soul, Ken, I'm sorry, Ren Kleiss, Koya Elliott, and David Parker. Sound of Metal, Nicholas Becker, James Bext, Michelle Kutalanek. Mm, that's that's not right. Carlos Cortez and Philip Blad. Now, I do want to say that they combined sound mixing and sound editing this year, so it's just sound. So who do you think, or do you want to win? I keep forgetting. We're not doing predictions. Who do you, who do you <laughs> think will win? Uh, I, would, I would actually really like Greyhound to win. And funny, here's mm. like a funny thing for me. It's so weird that two of Tom Hanks' movies, News of the World and Greyhound, were nominated in various categories, yet he didn't receive a single nomination this year. Are you saying he was snubbed? I, I'm just saying it's Tom Hanks. He's he's got like that's like leaving Meryl Oscars. Streep out of it. Okay, <laughs> I'm surprised she wasn't nominated this year. She must not have showed up in anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you want Greyhound? I'm pulling for Sound of Metal, actually. Okay, that they they do a wonderful effect by actually the absence of sound, but also the impact of sound. And I think that's it's very important to the film, and they do such a wonderful job that it really stood out to me. And mine for Greyhound is actually kind of more of it's the same thing, but reverse, because they the way that they use sound exudes the tension and the entire atmosphere for the film. It's what keeps you engaged and it helps yeah. retain the audience. It was so pivotal to the success of the film. And so they did a really great job. You know, throughout this podcast, you're going to hear a lot of conversation about Promising Young Woman. And now yours to own on digital Blu-ray and DVD, you can dive deeper into the critically acclaimed and wildly entertaining Promising Young Woman. Now nominated for five Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Original Screenplay, and Best Actress, Carrie Mulligan. Don't miss the Rotten Tomatoes certified fresh film that critics are calling a game-changing masterpiece. Now with exclusive bonus content that takes you behind the scenes at the edge of your seat story with the cast and writer-director Emerald Fennell. Bring home the film everybody is talking about on digital, Blu-ray, and DVD today. And we've talked about this film a lot. We love Promising Young Woman. Everybody should give it a chance if you haven't already. And if you want a chance to win a Blu-ray copy of your own, share this very episode on your social media app. Go to thehollywoodoutsider.com, find the episode, share it there, share it through your app, whatever means you have to share the episode. And then send us an email to contests at thehollywoodoutsider.com. That's contests at thehollywoodoutsider.com with your name on the subject line, I am a promising young woman. That's right. Contests at thehollywoodoutsider.com with the, your name on the subject line, I am a promising young woman. And we are going to ship one of five Blu-rays to select winners that have to be in the United States. So it is limited to the U.S., but please get that to us ASAP and we will enter you into our Promising Young Woman giveaway. All right, short film, live action. The nominees, Amanda, or Noah, is it me? No, it's you. Yeah, it's me. So short film, live action nominees are Feeling Through, Doug Rowland and Susan Rusensky, The Letter Room, Elvira Lind and Sophia Son. Sophia Sondervan, The Present, Farah Nabolsi, Two Distant Strangers, Trevon Free and Martin Desmond Rowe, White Eye, Tomer Shoshan, and Shira Hockman. I like when you read these off because you read them all professional-like. Like you're actually doing the Oscars. Look at you, you're ready to go. <laughs> as I long am... as I, I pretend like I'm not slandering their names, so I, I try to exude <laughs> a level of confidence here. On the off chance that I do. And I, the next one, you've got some some rough names to figure out pronunciation for. Oh, so. good. Because you want the guy who can never get a name pronunciation correct. I would. I don't know any of these. So I, I'm just. I don't want to pull for something if I haven't seen them. So I will just yeah. say I hope they all win. Congratulations on being nominated. <laughs> wow. <laughs> all right. Short film animated. The nominees are Burrow. Madeline Sherafian and Michael Caprot, Genius Losi, 
Adrian Mergo and Amori Ovis. If anything happens, I love you. Will McCormick and Michael Govier. Opera, Eric O. Yes, people. Gisle, Derry, Hildorsen, and Arner Gunnarsson. I'm going to pull the same thing as I did for the short film live action. I don't know, so congratulations, and I hope you all win. <laughs> Uh, I think this is a real testament to America's failure on multi-language. <laughs> yeah, or at least my failure on it. Uh, here's my my thing. Like short film animated and, uh, and action, I just don't watch short films ever. It's a personal choice. Yeah. I just don't ever. I've got so much content to watch TV and movie wise. I don't, I, I just never take the opportunity. And maybe that's unfair of me. I definitely know that many great directors and great filmmakers have emerged from short films. So I, I, I really wish the best to everyone that's nominated because you have done a great work because there's a ton of short films out there. The one that I was really hoping to see in the live action, and, and I never looked into seeing if it was eligible for its criteria, but when we talked about South by Southwest last year, there was one short film that I watched, which is very rare for me as well, and that was Single. And it was so much fun. It was so great. I want a full film from it. And so th that's one of the few times where I've seen a short film and I'm like, wow, you really deserve to be in here. And then they're not. And I'm like, oh, sad. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh, sad. Yeah. So production design. Our nominees are The Father. Production design by Peter Francis. Set decoration by Kathy Featherstone. Moraney's Black Bottom, production design by Mark Ricker, set decoration by Karen O'Hara and Diana Stoughton. Mank, production design by Donald Graham Burt, and set decoration by Jan Pascal. News of the World, production design by David Crank, and set decoration by Elizabeth Keenan. And our last is Tenant, produc production design by Nathan Crowley, and set decoration by Kathy Lucas. Do, 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 do. Production design, I will, even though I didn't like Mank, I'll explain more the further yeah. we go. But I will say the production design, set decoration, all, I've said many times, the filmmaking aspects of it are gorgeous. I, I think it's a beautifully shot film. I just don't think it's a good film. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> the, that's the difference. So I would, I would lean toward Mank because I do think they, they do a wonderful job between this and the cinematography to emulate that 1940s style that intended i think are going to have a little bit of a close head together because sure. one is really reaching into the future the other is trying to reach into the past and both of them have their own unique barriers and difficulties to overcome mank i think has a little bit more of a head on it and i'm leaning towards just because trying to relay that black and white visual element and how all everything that goes into your production, you have to really think about how bright it is, how dark it is, because of how it will be portrayed through the camera when you're changing that into black and white. So, right, right. you know, I think that one really takes a head for that. Okay. Music, original song. We're going to get that one song for that one movie that I can't stand, but everybody seems to like, so I'm wrong. What song is that? Oh, you'll hear. You'll okay. hear. Okay. Nominees are Fight for You from Judas and the Black Messiah, music by H.E.R., that's her, and Dernst Emil II, lyric by H.E.R. and Tierra Thomas. Hear My Voice from The Trial of Chicago 7, music by Daniel Pemberton, and the lyric by Daniel Pemberton and Celeste Waite. Hostovic from Eurovision Song Contest, the story of Fire Saga, music and lyric by Savan Kotecha. Max Van Zus and Richard Goranson. Scene from The Life Ahead. Music by Diane Warren. Lyric by Diane Warren and Laura Pausini. Speak Now from One Night in Miami. Music and Lyric by Leslie Odom Jr. and Sam Ashworth. Eurovision is that movie I couldn't stand. A John made me watch. <laughs> a John made me watch. And the music is actually fun and entertaining, so I don't have a fault with the songs. I, I think like they had a better song, like Ja Ja something i can't remember the name of it but you know i, I just I, I just didn't like that movie so i'm i'm going speak now because one night in miami i thought it was a great film leslie odom jr is great mm -hmm. so is. that one definitely has a head up on it hear my voice from the trial of chicago seven was also great so those are two what? that i'm leaning definitely. more towards 
For music original score, our mm. nominees are De Five Bloods, Terrence Blanchard, Mank, Trent Reznor, and Atticus Ross, Minari, Emile Masseri, News of the World, James Newton Howard, and Soul, Trent Reznor, Atticus Ross, and John Baptiste. Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross are doing some busy work these past few years. Man, they are on fire and they i'm are, gonna lean fantastic. towards soul for that one I, I really i just love the score i thought it was a great score agreed i wonder if people are, i know people have got to be mad because the five bloods spike lee's been making kind of a a lot of comments about how it's not getting nominated for stuff and i just didn't think it was that great a film i mean i think delray lindo should definitely have been on here but aside from that it's just okay i was not a big fan of the film it's just, it's okay to just be okay, man. Not everything deserves an Oscar and it doesn't mean anything. It just, it was just okay. I don't think Make should be on here either. I really don't <laughs> think Make should be on here. All right. What's next? Makeup and hairstyling. There's some things I know about. I wish I could say this as professionally as Amanda does, but Emma, Maurice Langan, Laura Allen, and Claudia Stoltz. Hillbilly Elegy. What are you doing here? <laughs> Aaron Kruger Makash, Matthew Mungle. And Patricia Dahani, uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Sergio Lopez Rivera, Mia Neal, and Jamika Wilson, Mank, Gigi Williams, <laughs> Kimberly Spateri, Sp- 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 and Colleen LaBeouf. I hope they don't listen to this because I just feel bad now. Pinocchio, Mark Clier, Delia Coley, and Francesco Pigaretti. Something like that. I've heard it always. <laughs> Actually, I know you made a joke about Hillbilly Elegy, but I actually think that that's the... I, I know that Emma's probably going to be the winner because that's what they always go for, or Mank. But I really, really liked Hillbilly Elegy as a movie, but I also think that they did a good job with makeup and hairstyling. It takes a lot of work to make Amy Adams look super unattractive. Yeah, Okay, that's fair. That is fair. <laughs> I mean, you know if what? you really think about it, she's a gorgeous woman. And I was like, hmm, Okay. You convinced me. I want to go for the upset. Let's go. Let's go, Hillbilly <laughs> Elegy. Let's do this. Let's shake them all up because everybody in the other categories are going to be pissed. So I like that. Let's go for it. <laughs> all right. Makes for the Oscar interna- contest a little easier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, for international feature film, our nominees are Another Round from Denmark, Better Days from Hong Kong, Collective from Romania, The Man Who Sold His Skin from Tunisia, Quavadia ID. Close Is enough. that right? Okay. <laughs> From Bosnia and Herzegovina. Govna. Govna. <laughs> you're this so close sorry. to saying Russian space station. You know that, right? Like, you're this close. Back up. I'm just, I feel so bad right now. <laughs> but you know what? You didn't do anything intentionally. That's when it's mean. That wasn't intentional. Yes. That was just. I just really tried my best and I, I am fine with laughing at myself. Exactly. The man who sold his skin, though, that sounds very Hannibal. <laughs> I think that's just what you want it to be. <laughs> like That's the movie you want it to be. You're like, I really hope somebody actually takes their skin off and sells it, because that would be fun. <laughs> you never know. No. What are you pulling for here? I don't know all of them well enough to be able to pull for them, for anyone in particular. Well, I'm pulling for another round, because the concept of, let's all get drunk, and... See how life falls is magnificent. (laughs) And the movie's actually kind of fun. And the end scene, if you haven't seen it yet, I'm sure you can probably find it on YouTube by now, but it's a it's it just makes you want to dance. It just makes you want to stumble and dance. And hey, I'm I'm all for it. So I'm going for another round. And I actually after this I might actually go for another round. (laughs) Okay, film editing. The nominees are The Father, Yorgos Laprinos. No Man Land, Chloe Zhao, Promising Young Woman, Federic Thoraval, Sound of Metal, Mikkel Nielsen, The Trial of the Chicago Seven, Alan Baumgarter Garden. I would uh, I'm leaning toward the Trial of Chicago Seven. I, I think it's a well constructed film. Like the editing is very crisp. I say that because Definitely I noticed agree it. On that. Although I would say the father should be in there because it definitely it belongs in this conversation. It seems weird because such a simple character piece of a movie but because of how the pieces work and how it's intercut i mean the whole movie is presented pretty Ah. much from from the perspective of anthony hopkins dementia so you're going from room to room person to person and things can change people can change scenarios change and it's beautifully 
orchestrated, written, and edited. So I, I think that it does belong in the conversation. I just I just remember thinking about the editing during the trial of Chicago 7 as it really stood out to me. And going on to documentary short subject, our nominees are Colette, Anthony Guccino, and Alice Doyard. A concerto is a conversation. Ben Proudfoot and Chris Bowers. Do not split. Anders Hammer and Charlotte Cook. Hunger Ward. Sky Fitzgerald and Michael Schumer. A love song for Latasha. Sophia Nali, Allison, and Janice Duncan. Um, Hop on up to the features. Well, hang on. Uh, love song for Latasha because I like the title. Sounds okay. sweet. <laughs> okay. Hunger Ward <laughs> sounds like it has a really like interesting and probably devastating plot to it. But sure. Latasha, a love song for Latasha sounds sweet. It sounds like a, it's a pretty title. You know, I want something happy. That's what I'm saying. Documentary feature nominees. Collective, Alexander Nono and Bianca Oana. Crip Camp, Nicole Newman, Jim Lebrecht, and Sarah Boulder. The Mole Agent, Mate Alberti, and Marcella Sentabeniz. Wait, I, I think everybody's just listening to see how I can butcher someone's name. Strap in. More's coming. My Octopus Teacher. Pippa Elric, James Reed and Craig Foster, and Time, Garrett Bradley, Lauren Domino, and Kellen Quinn. Crip Camp. Really? That one's about teen disabled or disabled teens and them overcoming. And yeah, it's just touches a sweet spot. Uh, I'm saying Time. And if you haven't seen it, find it, watch it, and you might learn something about, you know, Time. Time. Is that one outside? Let's go that to costume one's on design. Prime video, right? I don't remember. I think so. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Moving on over to. I'm just going to say yes. I don't really know, but I'm just, yes. <laughs> I trust Amanda. Sure. Moving on over to costume design. Our nominees Emma, Alexandra Byrne, Moranius Black Bottom, Anne Roth, Mank, Trish Somerville, Mulan, Bina Dagler, Pinocchio, Massimo Cantini Parini. Well, that kind of rhymes, if I said it right. <laughs> Say it three times real fast. So <laughs> wh what do you think in terms of costume design? You know, Emma feels like a, a go-to whenever you have those period pieces. Mm -hmm. They're hard to beat. But at the same time, mank has got a real possible advantage. And, and I kind of lean for it just because of the complexities of designing a costume and I was watching some videos and reading some interviews about this and the complexities that they had because, again, when you're going into a black and white film, when you're trying to make it look visually appealing on screen, it's hard to do in the right way if you don't have everything outlined and detailed. And that goes down to even the costume design and all of the work that they had to put into it to make it perfect really, I think, gives it a little bit of an upper hand. So while I'm with you on Mank not being an exceptional movie or film, I do think that it has some advantages in costume design and some other categories. On this one, I'm going with Mulan. Ah. The costume design was phenomenal, honestly, across the board. And it's just, it, it's one where it stuck with me. And, and I'm just like, wow, that looks fantastic. I mean, she looks sleek. The entire, the warriors are all outfitted with with uh, time appropriate gear. It's just it's very beautifully shot. It isn't trying to emulate the cartoon. It's trying to it's trying to emulate actual China during this regime. So it it's a beautifully shot film for sure and the costume design is just just phenomenal. That's the only word I can think of. So it it stands out like Emma looks like every other period piece movie. And I know those kind of win very often, but if I'm going to go period piece, I'm going Milan on this one. That's a, a great commentary. I I may have switched my thoughts. <laughs> Cinematography. The nominees are Judas and the Black Messiah, Sean Bobbitt, Mank, Eric Messerschmidt, News of the World, Darius Wolski, Nomadland, Joshua James Richards, The Trial of Chicago 7, Feedin Papa Michael. What a fantastic name that guy has. Or woman. I don't know which that is, but <laughs> fantastic name either way. Uh, Mank. That's Mank for me 100%. Like I said, before. yeah, yeah, I think there's some well, that might go more in directing for Nomad Land, but when you talk about using real people and the difficulties that that presents, 
it's I think it just makes it really difficult to grab good scenes and to make it look like you're not using real people all the time. Real people. I mean, non-actors. Real people. <laughs> real people. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think Mank is just a stunningly shot film. And like yeah. I said before, I, I wish it was a better movie. I just didn't think it was a great movie. It felt like more of a passion project that was. Yeah, that I is can see that. Heralded as a beautiful film because it, you know, is basically a Gary Oldman's strong performance and you have it's referencing Citizen Kane. It's all Hollywood. Hollywood mm-hmm. loves Hollywood more than anyone else in the world loves Hollywood. And they love to reward the, the films that celebrate themselves. It's just not a movie that I thought was a very good film. But it's yeah. a great visual set piece. Yeah. So there you go. Moving on to animated feature film, our nominees are Onward, Dan Scanlon, and Corey Ray. Over the Moon, Glenn Keane, Jenny Rim, and Palin Cho. Ashan, The Sheep Movie, Farmageddon, <laughs> Richard Phelan, Will Becker, and Paul Cooley. Soul, Pete Doctor, not O-R-E-R, and Dana Murray. Wolfwalkers, Tom Moore, Ross Stewart, Paul Young, and Stefan Rolance. I'm going onward. I think between all of these, that's the one that I really? enjoyed the most. Really? And I would go back to, yeah. Why, why did you enjoy that one the most? I'm, I'm just kind of curious because I remember I didn't really like it. Now, maybe I'm missing something that you enjoyed. I mean, quite honestly, I wasn't over the moon with any of these <laughs> <laughs> too much to, but but when i look at them i remember fondly onward it was fun it had a really sweet story so that's just kind of why i lend to that one versus some of the others well i'm going to it's close it's not it's not gonna be the sheep movie so close uh but wolf Walkers. not farmageddon Mm-mm. wolf Walkers. that's what i'm going for Ah, okay. It, it's a very interesting story. It's on Apple Plus, so I mean, you gotta have Apple to watch it, which sucks. But <laughs> it's uh it's it's really interesting. I I really dug it. It's very creative and kind of unique in terms of its animation style, and it's very fun. All right, actress in a supporting role. We're finally to the acting categories. Maria Baklava for Borat subsequent movie film. I'm not reading the rest of that title. You remembered. Glenn Close for Hillbilly Elegy. Glenn Close nominated again. This is like her 412th nomination and she still hasn't won the poor thing. Oh. Uh, Olivia Coleman for The Father. Amanda Seyfried for Mank. That's great. Yu Jun Yin for Minari. I, hmm. <laughs> this one's kind of, this one is a very competitive field. I mean, the acting categories generally are anyway. And I'm still very surprised Maria Bakla- Bakalova. Baklava? That's yeah, and that's who I'm rooting for. I'm actually, I'm pulling for her. I She's the only thing from that movie I really liked, and I loved her. Like, she I loved, was great. Yeah, I loved her. So I'm going to, I'm pulling for her. I feel like Glenn Close and Olivia Coleman. Oh, they'll I think be fighting in, it out, for sure. They will, yeah. Which one do you got? Which one do you want? Mm, I have not seen The Father, so this makes it a little difficult, because I know Olivia Coleman's probably got an incredible performance in that. She's great. She just won an Oscar. I mean, you can go for Glenn. It's okay. <laughs> she a poor woman has never won, and she deserves an Oscar at some point. Yeah. I don't believe in deserves, yeah. though. I believe it should be merit. Glenn Close did an amazing job in Hillbilly Elegy, though. Like, she was excellent. Yeah. Moving on to actor in a supporting role, our nominees, Sasha Baron Cohen, The Trial of the Chicago 7, not the other one. That one's Daniel- warranted. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. He yeah. was fantastic in that. Daniel Kaluuya, Judas and the Black Messiah, Leslie Odom Jr., One Night in Miami, Paul Racy, Sound of Metal, Lakeith Stanfield, Judas and the Black Messiah. Okay, I just want to say I am ecstatic that Leslie Odom Jr. and Paul Racy are in this. Because yeah. they've been, Paul Racy has been ignored pretty much through through a lot of awards contention. And he, to me, I thought he was the heart of that whole movie. Uh, Riz Ahmed is great, but I think for whatever reason, I think Paul Rossi just carries it. But my my pulling for is Daniel Kaluuya. This is, this is one where I was pulling for Sasha Baron Cohen until I saw Judas and the Black Messiah and Daniel Kaluuya. It just... Mop the floor with everybody that's a contender, as far as I'm concerned. 
Yeah, this is a really, really tough category because I enjoy all of them. And I think that they're all so, so, so well deserved to be nominated and win. So I would not be mad if any of them won. But I'm with you. I think Daniel really, he he just was on another level. And I never felt like he was acting. It always felt like this is just who he was. Yep. And he was yep. able to inspire and move and th- just collectively gather the audience the way that it's presented he does in the film. When I was explaining to somebody why I thought he deserves to win, like it shouldn't even be, I, honestly, just take the other four out of it. <laughs> because he took a very known public figure and somehow made that character his own. And that is incredibly difficult to do. And I, I just... I was astounded. Like, he was so good. I just didn't know he could be that good, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, astounded. like, we knew he was good. We didn't know he was that good. Yeah, I didn't know he was <laughs> that good. I was like, get out. You are great. Uh, see that? Mm-hmm. You're welcome. Ah! <laughs> Actor in a leading role. I'm going to leave on my shame on that one. All right, so Riz Ahmed for Sound of Metal. Riz Ahmed is the first Muslim to be nominated for lead actor, although Mahershala Ali has won twice before, I believe, for supporting actor. Chadwick Boseman for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Anthony Hopkins for The Father, Gary Oldman for Mank, Stephen Yun for Minari. And yes, it is Yun, not Yun. Just so people know. This is uh this is gonna be an emotional category because uh, yes, you have plenty of people who are deserving Chadwick Boseman, whether he wins or not, I think it's just gonna be it's just gonna be emotional for everyone, especially if he does win given that he's passed away. So I I am personally rooting for him. I really hope he gets this. You know, I, it's, I'm trying to be also fair in that I'm not saying that just because he won't have future roles. And I think he's such a fantastic actor that he deserves right. the award. But I think that's like an additional component to me. Like I'm rooting for him because of his portrayal, but I'm also rooting for him because he deserves to be recognized in his final performance. This is the hardest of all the categories for me. I, I think every single nominee should win. And that that's that's difficult. And by the way, hoorah to Steven Young for, for finally being recognized for the acting that he can do. Because I feel, I always felt bad. He was on a very, very genre heavy show, The Walking Dead. But he absolutely was the humanity and heart of the entire series. And nobody ever really gave him credit for it. They're always like Rick Grimes, which yeah, I love Andrew Lincoln, but he really brought humanity. When he left the show, that's when people just started leaving in droves. And it wasn't just because, well, you killed one of my favorite characters. It's because you killed the best actor on the show, period. He's just that good. And he's never really gotten the credit for it. And he becomes the first Asian American nominated for an Oscar too. That's fantastic. I was going to say, we have to mention that this is the first yeah. time in 93 years where there are these two fantastic actors who are of Asian descent and are nominated. So I think that's fantastic on its own, but these are also incredibly deserving nominees as well. Absolutely. But who I'm pulling for is difficult because with, like you, I, I get Chadwick Boseman has the, he passed away card in his favor. I don't think anybody here is undeserving. I yeah. just feel, and I know he's won before and he's been celebrated his whole life and da, 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 da. But I don't know if I've seen a performance that really moved me in this way in a very long time, like Anthony Hopkins did in The Father, because it's just something that's never really been well represented on film, like dealing with dementia and the entire movie his character doesn't know exactly where he is or what to, and it's basically a slow realization kind of that he's in this scenario, but even, even that it's not even a full realization. So it's so layered and there are so many particular pieces to his performance that I just, I have to, I have to give the edge to Anthony Hopkins, but that said, any of these men win, they deserve it. Absolutely. Yep. So moving on to our actress in a leading role. We've got some great ladies here who are Same nominated. Same problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Viola Davis, Moraney's Black Bottom, 
Andra Day, The United States versus Billie Holiday, Vanessa Kirby, Pieces of a Woman, Frances McDormand, Nomadland, Carrie Mulligan, Promising Young Woman. Whoo! These ladies are some scene stealers. <laughs> yeah. mm. I know. I feel, well, I shouldn't say I know. I feel like you're probably really going to pull for Carrie Mulligan, and she was fantastic, and I loved her. Frances McNorman is always amazing. Vanessa Kirby is an incredible actress. Andrew Day stealing as Billie Holiday. But Viola Davis is just like, she just uh, has, always has such an incredible performance that touches me in a different way and gives me goosebumps. So that's who I'm rooting for. Yeah, this one's difficult because I know Carrie Mulligan kind of makes the movie for Promising Young Woman, a movie I love. She does, for yeah. sure. <laughs> or maybe you're in love. But <laughs> I, I just, man, it's the same problem. It really is the same problem. Frances McDormand is in a movie I just thought was good. But she she's the only reason it really works for me. I mean, so, I mean, she's the primary factor. Vanessa Kirby, it's on Netflix. You should really watch Pieces of a Woman because she, she's heartbreaking. Andra, Andra Day, <sighs> the movie isn't very good. I think she's great. The movie I don't think is very good. I I just didn't enjoy it very well. But I really loved her performance. But Viola Davis, I'm with you. Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, and she she is she's a force. Always has been. Always will be. She's yeah. A force. I love that phrasing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I I will go with Viola Davis as well. But like I said, anybody else wins. Ain't mad. <laughs> yep. Now directing, you know, if one of them wins, I'm gonna be mad. <laughs> so. <laughs> I already know who that is. Yeah. But another round, Thomas Vinterberg, Mank, David Fincher, Minari, Lee Isaac Chung, No Man Land, Chloe Zhao. And it should also be noted that Chloe Zhao is the first woman of Asian descent to be nominated for director. Promising young woman, Emerald Fennell. Who are you pulling for? Now, yes, David Fincher is the one I don't want to win because <laughs> I like he is a great director. This is not a great film. So I just This don't is think definitely he not it. his best either. I don't think it felt like an easy target for the Oscars. You know, like it was just it's that typical Oscar bait. It's us. It's about us. Yeah, (laughs) that's really why it's up here. But it just to me, it's just even from the initial trailers and stuff, it just never struck me as, oh, I'm so moved. And that's a huge piece of movies for me is does it. Does it do something to me emotionally? Do I feel that impact? And so I really am rooting for Emerald Fennell for Promising Young Woman. Okay. I I just want to say, Shaka King instead of Thomas Vinterberg? What? I just, you know, another round was was good. Another one where it's just, it's good, but really? I just don't see that. I I don't. Yeah. I don't do snubs. I don't like the term snub, but that feels like a snub. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I would agree. I would agree with you there. And how are you going to end up in the best picture, spoiler alert, but not be in the directing category? Well, it happened to Ben Affleck for Argo, and he still got um, he still got robbed. That was unfair yeah. BS. That one, that one best picture, and he still didn't get best director. Like, what? Director's the one that puts pieces together, you sons of bitches. What are you talking about? Doesn't mean, just because you don't like the Batfleck doesn't mean you got to rob the man. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Okay, so Mank, no. It's just, it, no. But I'm going to say, because I know a lot of people are pulling for No Man Land, and, and Chloe Zhao is a, is a very excellent director. Emerald Fennell, great director. You're going Minari. I, no Man Land is just a good film. I think it gets more acclaim because of the fact they use real people instead of actors for many parts, and that's great. It's not. It does not make a great movie to me. Promising Young Woman, I think, is a wonderful script, and she does a, a wonderful job as director, but Minari is the biggest surprise I've had in a long time. So mm, Lee Isaac Chung has got my, got my vote. And even if Shaka King was in here, he'd still get my vote. I just, man, watch it. I'm telling you, man, to watch it. You, you'll be, you'll be moved. Yeah. I'm, I'm, it's on my list. I can't wait to watch it. Thank God the Academy did not include it for international film. I would have been pissed because it's about, yeah. it's an American story. It's an American yeah, story. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. All right, so our final category, the Mm -hmm. one everyone has been waiting for, Best Picture. Our nominees are The Father, David Parfit, Gene Louis, Livy, and Philip 
Philippe? Philippe? Philippe. Philippe? And Philippe Carcassonne, producers. Judas and the Black Messiah, Shaka King, Charles D. King, and Ryan Coogler, producers. Mank, Jane? Zane? Sure. Chaffin? <laughs> Eric Roth and Douglas Urbanski, producers. Minari, Christina O, oh, producer. Nomadland, Francis McDormand, Peter Spears, Molly Asher, Dan Janvey, and Chloe Zhao, producers. Promising Young Woman, Ben Browning, Ashley Fox, Emerald Fennell, and Josie McNamara, McNamara, producers. Sound of Metal, Bert Hamlink, and Sasha Ben Harok, producers. The Trial of the Chicago Seven, Mark Platt and Stuart Bessers, Besser, producers. So, Amanda, where do you land on all these? Where, where, where is your best picture hope? Ooh. Again, okay. not, not who you think will win, who you right, want right, 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 to win. Right, 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 Because I already know who, I, I already have a very clear indication, I feel like, in my head of who I think will win. Oh, could win. it be Nomadland? Because that's the only movie that anyone seems to know anymore. Could it be that one? <laughs> or Mink! <laughs> Oh, I don't think Mank is going to win. I, I just I just don't. I think No Man Land has got too No much. Man Land is probably at the lead. But, you know, there's oh, there's so many good movies in this category. There are two that I haven't seen, though, which really, really changes things. Because, as you say, Minari is supposed to be incredible and, and emotionally impactful and moving and powerful and fantastic acting. The Father, I have yet to see. And that uh, one's also supposed to be in that category. Based is, on what I'm sure. hearing and what and what I understand about these different films, it feels like my personal pick will be between three films. And I say that because I haven't seen one of them. Okay. Judas and the Black Messiah, Minari, and Promising Young Woman. And I, I can't break that tie until I see Minari. Okay, well, you can break it between Judas and Promising Young Woman, though. That's true. That's true. Uh, but can I, though? <laughs> <laughs> but can I? Sure you can. So I'm probably going to choose between Promising Young Woman and Judas and the Black Messiah. Judas and the Black Messiah, because I feel like everything was a bit sharper and simply having a film that sits with me in terms of whether I like it or love hate it doesn't necessarily make it best picture. So that's why I would lean towards Judas and the Black Messiah. And so it would be that versus Minari. Okay. So, you know, it's funny, you know, I would just went on about the director of Minari. Well, the director I wanted wasn't nominated and that was Aaron Sorkin. I mean, I, I know that was a snub. I know it's a snub. But I was just like, why? Why bother? That's my best picture. It is, to me, best picture means the best film overall, all around, 100%, everything involved film you saw in the past year or 14 months if it's this year. It's so weird. And The Trial of Chicago 7 is one where every performance just mm -hmm. dominates. It came at a time where everything in the film was so pivotal to what was actually going on in real life. And it wasn't intended that way. It just worked out that way. So it really hit me on an emotional level in that respect. And Aaron Sorkin just has a way of working dialogue and working emotion and heart into something that is quite, quite tragic in a way, in, in many ways. And I just think overall, it's a beautiful film. And I know it doesn't, it's not going to get as many accolades and it probably won't win many awards. But for me, that was the best film that I saw. So I'm going with the trial of Chicago seven. Of these That's numbers. a great pick. I, I remember bawling. Like I'm pretty sure I cried through the majority of that movie. Oh, and Sasha Baron Cohen is so such good. an impact. Yeah. And <laughs> you know what? Like I know who he is, but I was like, wait a second, who is that? <laughs> <laughs> because it was just a little bit different. And I will say to your point, all of the characters did like, I loved them all. I cared for them all. In terms of the Chicago 7, I, I started looking them up like, I want to send them letters or something. Are any of them still alive? It just, it was a very powerful story. And it was so well presented. Mm -hmm. And not just not just in a, here's, here's what historically happened, we want you to know and understand. But also just 
like the the personal impact for those individuals and what they went through and their different personalities. And I felt like I got to know them through these actors and it felt like they were those characters. It, it was it was wonderful. There we go. Now we get to wait until <laughs> April 25th, 2021, at whatever the hell time you got it at, <laughs> to watch the Oscars and see who wins. Now, I got to ask you before we go, do you feel like this year's Oscars is going to be, well, it's, I think it'll probably be the lowest rated in a long time just because so many people didn't see so many movies and didn't realize there were that many movies out. But do you feel like it's a little different because we didn't have theaters and so many of these went to video on demand, went to streaming, went to, I mean, do you, do you feel like it's going to be a, a, an odd Oscars or do you feel like, Hey, movies, movie. Eh, no, I mean, it's odd no matter what, just because of the conditions and circumstances of the past year or 14 months or whatever. But I do know that there are a lot more people who typically are not movie buffs, if you will, that have been catching these films. And that extends them into this world a little bit deeper because they were more accessible at home, especially when there was a lot more downtime for some people who were unemployed or laid off or, you know, maybe struggling with their health conditions or losing family members. And so connecting through a film medium really, you know, it it helps improve our mood, at least for me it does. It, it gives me something to distract, distract myself with. So I do think more people are going to be engaged with the, or have been engaged with the movies. I don't necessarily think that that's going to translate into more viewers for the Oscars because a lot of those same people who are catching these movies are also some of the same people who feel like Hollywood is a little bit too focused on itself. And when you have <laughs> kind of a pretty consistent history of your voting patterns and people don't really feel like they're what they enjoy the audience, if you will, perspectives are taken into account. It's just about what do these high esteemed rich people think about their Hollywood films. It, it detracts people from wanting to watch the award show. So I don't know. Yeah, I I really wonder, because so many people I know aren't even going to be watching the Oscars this year, to be perfectly honest, because they didn't see many of these films and they don't know a lot of these films. But I, but I really hope that they will check them out because these are there's a lot of great films here. I mean, there weren't too many that I think aren't that very aren't that good, Mank, but the majority of them are quality independent films, a lot of them. Or smaller budget, you know, things that wouldn't get as much play in any other given year. So I, I just, I hope more people will find these films and give them a chance because there's a lot of quality here. And even though it's been a weird, weird, weird year, we still had a lot of great films to watch. I mean, we had more than we've ever had, I think, <laughs> between film and television. I feel like I don't need to watch anything for a very long time. Well, people just have had more time to watch these things. And That's I think another sure. really, a really great point to it, especially if you're not watching it for like film criticism purposes and you're just like casual viewing, a lot of people want when they're working from home, like to have background noise. And now that employers are recognizing, especially because of the pandemic, that people can work from home and they can still get their work done. People are throwing these movies on and they're getting connected to different content than they normally would have on their own or would have had time for. So that's another reason, I think, why and contributing factor to people catching these movies that normally would not have had the time to maybe go to the theater and watch it because as amazing as the theater experience is, for some people, their theaters aren't even open near them. It's also right, additional right. time if you have families at home. You know, it's it might not work with your schedule when the showings are and finding a babysitter. And so when the kids go down, you and your spouse can sit down and watch a movie. So that changes the dynamics of accessibility a lot. And I'm happy to see streaming services getting recognition for their films in the Oscars. Because it's really setting a precedent that it doesn't matter where your film comes from, where it's premiered, where you can find it, as long as it met the criteria that the Oscars, the, the Academy has set, then 
you have a movie that is eligible and can be part of that. And that sets a huge standing for independent filmmakers who maybe feel have felt in the past like the Academy Awards were too far out of their reach. It's not that case anymore. And you can land a deal with Netflix who's trying to work with independent filmmakers and still see your movie in the Oscars. Yeah, I think it's great. Love and Monsters, yeah. I never thought would be in the Oscars. Never, I think it's never. It's so wonderful. That was one of my happiest moments. Looking through the nominees, I was like, what? <laughs> I can't believe <laughs> this movie happened? got in here. This is great. Oh, that's funny. And Stephen Young getting nominated. It was, it was a happy surprise, too. I hope people check out Mayhem. That's a, that's a film that he did. Oh, God, that's so fun. <laughs> it's a ridiculous movie, but he's so good in it. Well, I think that's that's it. Uh, in terms of, of the Oscar nominations, you know, we'll find out the winners on April 25th, 2021. We will have our Oscar contest here next week. So keep your your eyes on that. It'll be announced in the next episode. No, not the next episode, because the next one's going to be the, the Snyder Cut, which is not going to be eligible for Oscars. Much to everyone's probably happiness, but I've heard great things. So we'll see. But it'll be on our next, uh, the South by Southwest episode. We will announce our Oscar contest and how you can enter that. So start formulating your guesses, get them all picked out, and we will go from there. And you might win something. You might. Anything you want to say in closing in terms of the Academy Awards? Mm, I, you know what? I will say that the Academy has had a number of feats in terms of their PR damage control the last few years or handful of years where people have really started to confront them on their choices. And I feel like they have expanded their views and their reach a little bit. I hope that they continue to do so. It seems like we're getting a little bit more of a fair playing field here. It's not always going to be the big blockbusters. You know, I'm surprised. Zero Wonder Woman. Zero. You're really you're surprised? I am for v- at least for visual effects. I thought maybe something there. I'm surprised that there was nothing. Okay, yeah, I'm not really surprised by that. <laughs> I I was. I <laughs> really did not expect something them that surprised to me at all. Well, I expected them to expand a little bit more into that. That was yeah. Anyway, well, I'm just happy we're getting another Oscars and nothing got canceled because of whatever. Because apparently they're going to find a way to make this thing live. They're going to find a way. (laughs) Much to Amanda's chagrin. Because she's like, really? We can't have South by Southwest live, but we can have this where you celebrate each other and just tell each other you're beautiful? Come on. Yeah. Well, I also, they must have like some discreet access with their money to vaccines. Because they're really like, no, we'll be gathered. No big deal. And it's the same group of people who are like, stay home because there's a pandemic. And it's like, oh, but we, we're we good. So we'll be out there. As long as you're and- not celebrating us, stay home. <laughs> and I'm not saying that I disagree with like their the Hollywood's, you know, concept of staying home. It's not Hollywood's concept, but Hollywood really pushing that through the CDC recommendations. I'm just saying it's quite convenient that Hollywood was like, na na na, you can't be doing this. And now Hollywood's like, well, we, I guess we could. So. I will honestly say, as a lover of film and television and an admirer of all of their hard work and beautiful art that they have delivered all throughout the years, they are still the biggest hypocrites in the world. So <laughs> I am not surprised by this in any way, shape, or form. But this is a celebration of them. So we don't want to ruin that because they love a celebration of them. Yes, they do. Unless you're a stunt performer. That's all I've got to say about that. Mm. Get that category in there, you sons of bitches. All right. That's going to do it for this episode of The Hollywood Outsider. Remember, you can find all of our other podcasts at thehollywoodoutsider.com or on your favorite app. And thank you so much for listening. Remember that the next time you head to a theater or sit comfortably on your couch waiting for one to open, buy popcorn.